I'd like to start also by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where we're meeting today and their elders past and present. And Auntie Ali, I thought that introduction was simply wonderful. I don't know if it's available for others, but it's simply fantastic and your presentation was inspiring to me. And I think that, that the university having an elder in residence is just fantastic. And um, I know it's something I'll be mentioning back to our university as well. Obviously, the University of Melbourne is also trying to do, but not as, you know, as Pete said, not like you're doing at UNSW, and I think it's really terrific. Um, I'd also pick up on the point about the importance of the collaboration. Um, we've, in fact, just in my work, been collaborating through Ryan McIntyre and the Capacity Building Grant in Mathematical Modeling of Infectious Diseases, and then the Hubs work, with fund, it's funded by what we call Was Aid when it was giving money for international health and development and it doesn't seem to be important and it seems to be the best way you balance your federal budget by being more selfish than ever. And that's uh, was it's gone and but that I think that the effects of what was done in the hubs, in, particularly in the areas that we're interested in health services research and what you do in education, one of the ways how do we assess research, the impacts of that will be seen in decades time. The fact that we train people that work internationally, and many of you from overseas, in my work, I've mentioned that I worked in Tanzania, it's 30 years later that those people are heads of departments and deans and government advisors. And who could put a price on that or an impact factor compared with some articles in Nature and Science? I think it's a challenge we have. That's just by way of the interesting introductions we had, as my comment from someone from far away in the South. But my topic today um, is to try to start this, and I might need help. It was suggested that I press... You just need to uh, open the question. Let's just... So thank you for the over-generous introduction, um, and um, I don't have quite as long as I thought, so I'll be skipping through slides a little bit. It's not just because I've started with a thousand slides, it's just that it has been shortened a little. And I take it that I wasn't quite sure about the audience, but what I'd like to do in my introduction is highlight some of the points that are going to be important when we get to the main theme is, can we eliminate malaria? The first, of course, is to start with knowledge of the vector. And it's not all mosquitoes that carry malaria, but there is a big drive to feed. A female mosquito must have a blood meal to lay eggs, and therefore there's that drive to feed. And we must understand the interaction always of the vector with the human host and with the mosquito, and the environment is clearly important for that. The elements of the life cycle that I think are important to know about is that for the major form of falciparum malaria, after injection of parasites, there's a period of about uh, 10 days or so until the parasites emerge into the bloodstream and cause illness. And the drugs that we use work on this stage, and that's why if you've been a traveller to endemic area, you take tablets to kill these off, because if you happen to be bitten on the last day, although it's usually about two weeks till they appear in the blood, it could be up to four weeks. And so there, that's when you get sick, and from time to time you get sexual forms produced, and these are what are taken up by mosquitoes. So it's not just blood-to-blood -blood transmission like might happen with HIV or hepatitis C where the virus transfers. It's actually part of the life cycle. Now that's the story for falciparum malaria, but the second most common one, Vivax, which is also common in our region, parasites can sit here for a very long time. They can sit here for a matter of years. In my case, I went as a medical student at the end of one year to Papua New Guinea, and I got sick 18 months later with Plasmodium vivax. So that means when you're eliminating malaria, you've got to get rid of these ones. Totally asymptomatic patients with a residual burden of disease. Major, major problem. Similarly, after infection with all forms, these um, infectious forms, asymptomatic patients, but you've got parasites that can circulate for a very long time. There are four major species which we don't need to talk about a lot, but the ones that we're particularly concerned about, the ones this one, which causes cerebral malaria and the deaths in malaria and pregnancy, and this is the relapsing form of Vivax. Challenge for elimination, as I've said, it can be asymptomatic and also very, very hard. So in a thin blood smear, especially with a poor microscope, poor stain, 
very hard to see the individual parasite here, yet that person could have a lethal dose of plasmodium falciparum. So diagnosis is challenging, especially at low parasitemia. And you can be very, very, very sick without even seeing parasites in the blood. Another challenge. Fortunately, they're getting some rapid diagnostic tests, fingerprint blood on a piece of filter paper and do an immediate test. Works well for the most severe form, but doesn't work so well for plasmodium virax, so we're not quite there yet. That will help if people with minimal training can make a diagnosis. That's the normal presentation, a child a little bit sick with malaria, screaming, febrile illness, and the child's getting a fingerprint to make the diagnosis. In most cases, it's a relative, an illness, sweating and fever, from which you can make a spontaneous recovery. But you can't predict as to where the child might in fact then go on the next day to cerebral malaria. A child can be reasonably well and dead in 24 hours. Now that's really hard to make impact after someone's sick in order to make a difference to fight an outcome. So just treatment alone, particularly in rural and remote areas, is going to be a huge challenge if you're really trying to control in a public health way about malaria. Now, the, even in the best hands, even if this child came into hospital in Sydney or Melbourne, there's probably a 10 or 15% chance of mortality. Someone can be walking around and dead within 24 hours. That's why the, a message, if nothing else, for those that travel. Never let the sun set on a fever if you've been in an endemic area. There have been tragedies when people said, unwell Friday, come back Monday if you're still sick and the patient's dying. This is the pathology. And here, this is normal looking brain. And this is a capillary in the brain, and here the malaria infected cells clogging up this capillary. You can see the malaria pigment here, and the child can very rapidly go into coma. I haven't got time to talk about how much about how that happens, but what happens is the malaria, these are red cells, this is in the laboratory, these are malaria infected cells, and you can see these changes in the red cell, and it's changes in the red cell that give them the ability to stick into endothelium. So that can particularly be in the brain, but it can also be in the placenta. And a major problem is malaria in pregnancy. This is the baby's side. This is the mother's side. So you don't see any parasites in the baby, although they can cross. But look here, these are all malaria parasites lined up on the mother's side of the circulation, right at that layer, which is the transition layer, where nutrients and other things go from mother to baby. This is just absolutely chock-a-block with malaria-infected cells. So the same capacity of the malaria parasite to infect a red cell then change it. So it's as if a red cell's got Velcro on the outside and sticks in different places to cause that pathology. It's quite an unusual disease that you can get organ-specific pathology. So you can have a person who's a woman with um, placental malaria, but you can't find malaria in the blood, which is a problem for the diagnosis. Or you can have a child who's very, very sick and has malaria affecting in lungs, but not in the brain. And it turns out that malaria parasites got incredible ability to change those molecules on the surface of the red blood cells that makes them to stick either in brain or placenta. In fact, that's, there's a lot of work that actually came from starting our lab that worked on what is this interaction and could you prevent malaria in pregnancy. So, from a public health perspective, which is what we're looking at, and in a simple aspect, what causes malaria? Well, it's plasmodium falciparum malaria. That's far too simplistic a view about malaria, because it's like all things in infectious diseases, and you're tackling it from a public health perspective, you've got the whole interaction of the microbe, the host, and of course the environment. So climate is incredibly important. The mosquito number and type is very important. Not all anopheles carry malaria. Obviously, housing is important. If most of us went to live in the worst area of Medang, Papua New Guinea, we wouldn't expect to die of malaria because we can prevent it. That's Bill and Melinda Gates said. If they don't die, why should anyone die from this preventable disease? There's a human rights perspective to this as well because we have the tools and we need to apply them. Obviously, personal protection. There are some genetic conditions that reduce your risk from malaria. Most recently, and this will come up, with mobile populations in the Mekong region, huge transitions and movements of people, migrants, refugees, 
scandal of this government sending people to Manus and Nauru, where they're going to or Cambodia, at risk of malaria, uh, for example, but also refugee populations. You might have heard of outbreaks of malaria in Greece from people who um, uh, refugees who have been welcomed to Europe and then in, uh, some have had malaria in Greece. Climate change, we don't know overall some places would become more susceptible to malaria, some would become less. But we know what happens in the Sahelian region that you can have years with little malaria and people's immunity wanes, then it comes back and then huge epidemics in people of all ages because they lose their immunity that they might have acquired as children. So it's interesting to see, however, um, on this aspect to talk about post-parasite and environment in Sri Lanka where the um, major effects of malaria are seen. You can see the darker, the more malaria, and you wonder why is that clear? And when you look at the map, the reason, of course, is the geography. So you might have um, this area, high country and pool, where you don't have the mosquitoes, so the approach that you might use here, where this sort of epidemic malaria it might be different from your use around the coast. And people who go from here to here are at risk of getting malaria, people who go from here to here are at risk of taking malaria there. And I'm going to use Sri Lanka as an example a little later. So however, after those early interactions I showed you, most children eventually will get a clinical immunity. Some will die of cerebral malaria, some will in severe anemia but most will survive. So that these aged children who are at uh, primary school will not get, uh, after about the age of five, don't get symptomatic malaria. But these are a reservoir infection that we need to deal with if we're talking about elimination of malaria. And these children um, are not at risk of dying of malaria while they're constantly challenged. Which means once you put in a control program for a couple of years, as I've mentioned before in the Saheli ex Sahelian example, these kids are at risk. So Africans going to live in London for a few years, lose their immunity, then they're at risk. People in Papua New Guinea moving to Port Moresby, no malaria, go home and get malaria. So if we're thinking about elimination, these are some big challenges. And it's quite interesting to see what progress has been achieved. In, this is in 1900. Red means there's malaria. You notice there's malaria almost all around the world. A few Pacific islands, maybe. You might wonder how, the, how malaria survives in these areas. And it's the reason I told you before. Those particular species can rest in the liver, stay quiet all during the winter, along comes springtime, out come the mosquitoes, and away the epidemic goes again. So if we look at that, in 1900, it was just the early days of guessing about how malaria was transmitted, so it's only about 110 years or so since it's been proved or travelled by mosquitoes. But look what's happened. By 1945, not much change at all. Still malaria transmission in most places. By 1970, there's um, got rid of malaria from some places. 1990, starting to have a bigger impact. You'll notice by 1990 that the uh, Southern Europe is clear. The United States is clear and Australia is clear. Probably in the early 50s we would have declared malaria free. Malaria, Australia, if you take a line from Broome to about Townsville, we're susceptible in all this area. So a person with malaria coming back to here, we've got to be you know, potentially concerned about epidemic malaria in Australia. And by 2013, a lot less malaria. And many places here, now the blue bits, are actually aiming to eliminate malaria. There's not much malaria, for example, in Thailand, except at the borders. Mexico, very little. So the battle is being won, which is pretty amazing. And this is the hope for the next 10 years. We've been, as mentioned, I'm working, helping with the global technical strategy. What is a realistic achievement for the next 10 years if we have the resources? The major impact there was knowledge about malaria, application drugs, and particularly um, spraying houses with DDT. It's important to understand the mechanism. It's not like a spray you use around the barbecue. It's a spray that you put around the walls of your house because most of the mosquitoes that transmit malaria bite indoors in the evening then go and rest on the nearest available surface and ingest the chemical and they die. So the very ones that are they die. Very good. However, two things are happening. The, some mosquitoes become resistant to the chemicals and some mosquitoes bite and fly out the door and rest in the tree. 
So there's both a chemical reason for resistance and a behavioural resistance. And good work being done by some people in Queensland and the Pacific, the more intensively you apply these sort of strategy, the more the mosquito population is dominated by outdoor biting and biting at other hours, as you would expect. The biological adaptation is a huge problem as we try to address it. However, um, the current estimates, 2010, estimated 220 million cases with 660,000 malaria deaths, mainly in Africa. But that number in the past 15 years is actually halved. It was about 1.5 million, very uncertain. But that, in fact, is a public health triumph. It's not talked about much, but if we halve the deaths from HIV or we halve the deaths from tobacco, if we halve the deaths from road accidents, people have had it all over the rooftops. But it's been incremental and it's been a fantastic effort, a lot stimulated by the money made available and the stimulus of Bill and Melinda Gates in getting behind it, saying this is a human tragedy that we shouldn't even be allowing to happen. And in fact, it was those successes that made about four or five years for Bill and Melinda Gates to say, why don't we have an agenda to eradicate the disease? We've got the tools, we should do it. And so why would you do that? Well, obviously you want to get deaths and illness. But the big thing that won the argument for the money was that it was a, a burden on economic development. You never, If you go for altruism, you might the minute meet the Minister for Health. But if you can say it impairs economic growth by 1%, you get the Minister for Finance. And then you're battling money between the army and finance for malaria. We have to make the economic argument. Like in this country, we've got to find an economic argument for anything we wish to do. Altruism doesn't work. So we're making the case, and this is terribly important with respect to the post-2015 Millennium Development Goals. Altruism won't work. We've got to make the case um, that we need it for economic development. So um, why then there was a reaction? People said, this is stupid. We can't do it. And Bill and Melinda Gates said, well, at least we've got to have a plan to do it. But like when someone said, reduce to Melinda Gates, reduced maternal deaths by 90%. She said, are you going to choose the 10% who die? And they point out that that graph I showed is that 3 million lives saved if, it, if the rates had continued. One could be a Mandela, one could be an Elizabeth Blackburn, one could be who knows who. And so, and, and when Gates was challenged, why don't you do work on problems in America? He said, I'm a businessman. I can save a life for... I don't know what the figure was, $100,000 per year of life saved, something in America. But in the Africa, I can save a life for a much smaller amount of money. He didn't need to say a life is a life wherever it happens to happen, as we seem to be saying in Australia. So the reasons against it are that in the 50s was an effort to eradicate malaria that didn't work. Some would say we don't have the technology, that it was unrealistic. And of course, when malaria is a small problem, it's not a, a disease of public health importance. Like polio, if you think of the dollars per case at the moment, that's absolutely huge. I would say that's not a reason to stop polio eradication, but some people are saying it's too expensive, we should let it go. I totally disagree with that perspective. But if you're only having one or two sick people per year, people won't say, why aren't you doing it? So let's move a bit more... Um, the cautionary tale is in Sri Lanka. If we look at the history here, what happens is, this is 100 years ago, lots of malaria. Then as various different things were introduced, particularly this concept of using DDT, look what happened. But then what happened is people then got these problems, drug resistance, DDT resistance for behavioural change, then what happened, malaria came back. But if we look at the renewed effort from this last 10 years, what we see is a fantastic effort and Sri Lanka is very, very good at the moment in terms of its malaria. But the government is saying, malaria, no problem, therefore we can reduce the funding and it's almost inevitable that it will return. So there are lots of um, uh, stories like this where there were in Kenya, Nigeria, Sudan, where you had an intensive program, stop the program, back it comes. Intensive program, back it comes throughout the world. This is the history, like with polio, that for a public health perspective, you've got to keep going, keep going hard, way beyond the last cases that are determined. So malaria 
And if we go then now to what are the main tools that we've got here, um, first, bed nets, and bed nets impregnated with insecticides undoubtedly save lives. So if children up to five sleep under a net, pregnant women under a net, huge impact. Similarly, spraying of houses, not very different from um, what was done 50 years ago. Of course, environmentalists were concerned about DDT, but the way it's used to protect human lives is fun. It's when it was used widespread as an agricultural spray that it was a problem. The big issue is funding. The big inputs that came over the last 10 years were the big increase that went from about 100 million US dollars funding from outside sources for malaria. It went up to 1.66 billion by 2011. This huge increase. But still it's not enough. The estimates suggest that if we could take the 2 billion up to about 4 billion a year, that we could have a huge impact, bring it right, right down. Now, you might think $2 billion is uh, a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but it's a fraction of the percentage of one of those planes we're buying. It's a fraction of the profit of the ANZ Bank or the Commonwealth Bank. It's all about world priorities. And um, someone showed me this from, um, this was from National Public Radio in the United States. It's been on the web, and, but I haven't seen the original data, of course, but it hasn't been disputed, these costs. Someone had a look at the, um, Comparing global health financing costs of other initiatives, you know, compared to how much people spend on dog shampoo and dog food and things like that. And then here, of what the war in Iraq, quite interesting, NATO forces. But the one that really struck me, the amount the US military spent annually on air conditioning in Iraq and Afghanistan, $20.2 billion. And that was, now, there's the quote. Now, I don't know where the figures came from, but they haven't been disputed. A tenth of the air conditioning funding would make all the difference in malaria. So let's move on to some of the challenging problems apart from money. Obviously, where we open up country, we open up exposure to malaria and in forests, as we see in many parts of the world, in the Amazon, for example, in Indonesia, and people, rubber tappers or others working in the forest, there's no house, how do we spray them and attempt, for example, impregnated nets or clothes to get around that problem. In our region, in the Mekong region, there's huge development going on. And the Asian Development Bank has many such pictures demonstrating the opening up of these regions. Now, one of the particular challenges with these types of corridors is that obviously, we've all heard the story about transmission of HIV AIDS via roads and highways as the passageway of where the movement of infectious diseases, but the same as malaria. And the particular problem as we have here, this is going to be a big free trade zone and huge development projects. But over here in Myanmar and in Western Thailand, we have the worst resistant malaria that we have in the world, resistance to the latest drugs and combination therapy. So if you imagine from Thailand to Myanmar to here and then into India, India's got a growing problem with malaria. If resistance moves across these boundaries, not only will we have malaria, but we'll have drug-resistant malaria. And the options are incredibly expensive and not really effective. So in Cambodia's got some huge, very, in the high, foci, very high degree of resistance. So the opportunity here is enormous. And there have been many development projects whose economic benefits have been overridden by, uh, uh, by disease, and such as malaria in this setting. And to a public health perspective, we have a big problem here in the weak surveillance system. I noticed, John, you're speaking about data's, data and data is not boring. Here, we reckon about 10% of the cases, so the estimates I've given you are based on detection of only about 10%. And that the reasons are pretty obvious, but the uh, plan is to get to where we want to. Everyone needs a test for malaria, but so they're properly diagnosed and you don't <coughs> use drug when it's not needed because that can bring resistance. Treat every individual properly and track them with surveillance. Next thing is um, about appropriate treatment so that health systems effectiveness decay is something that a health minister in Cote d'Ivoire or Gabon would love to know. Why is it that I've got a drug or a combination here that I know from the research can be 98% effective, 
uh, about efficacy, but why is it only 37% of people actually get it when we go to effectiveness? And we need better measures for um, where is the decay in the system. So if malaria is happening in population, efficacy 98%, and then access is only 60%, diagnostics 90%, provider compliance, patient adherence, effectiveness 37%. So you can have a very efficacious intervention, but unless you can deliver it properly, we won't get the results that we want. So you can get greater gains here than by improving this from 98 to 100. And it's an obvious point in public health, but it needs to be re-emphasised. I've mentioned about the problems with drug resistance in our region that's been detected, and the problems that there are for that. The challenges for the world then are of these 650,000 deaths. A huge proportion of these deaths, if these are countries here, and you start adding the countries. So 40% of the deaths in Nigeria, um, then if you add Congo, Burkina Faso, Mozambique, Cote d'Ivoire, you can find it's a relatively small number of countries responsible for a high proportion of the deaths. 17 countries for 80% of the cases and 14 countries for 80% of the deaths. So those who are against the proposal about elimination eradication say you should focus just on these. Don't worry about elimination. I completely disagree with that. I think the world has enough money to do both. The Asia Pacific Malaria Elimination Network was funded by WASAID. We don't know if it's going to be funded under DFAT. Um, certainly the Ministry of Science isn't interested in it. But um, here we've got um, countries of the region that are trying to eliminate malaria. And the documentation, back to John Calder and data, it's really focal now. As countries get better and better, you'll find the diversity is present in those countries. When Bill and Melinda Gates said, we must try to eradicate malaria, I was part of a group working on what do we need in order to do it? What's the research agenda? Because a lot of the things that are needed for malaria don't have huge economic benefits for countries or commodity suppliers. And so often you need a public-private partnership in order to develop them. And we then identified the sort of things which would be extremely helpful. And we went through the various interventions. Obviously, if we had a vaccine, it would be fantastic. And a vaccine that blocked in our transmission. At the moment, it looks as though the vaccine that will be licensed probably by next year is going to give sort of 30 or 40 percent protection against disease for about 18 months. Huge challenges to whether you pay money to a, an intervention of reduced efficacy. We don't know what additional effect that will have to NETS and other interventions. Things like uh, better diagnostics. And obviously if we could do the sort of thing that's been done in dengue to reduce the ability of vectors to transmit malaria it would be enormously helpful. At a global level, um, the, there is a partnership, as Peter mentioned, I'm the Deputy Chair of the Rollback Malaria Partnership, which attempts to bring all the players together. And it's really an interesting international collaboration and consortium. So it brings together much more multilateral agencies that are supportive, such like UNICEF and UNDP, foundations, obviously huge input from the Lillian and Melinda Gates Foundation, donor countries, it's an old site, I'm sorry, I was still there, Research in Academia is represented as well. Global Fund for AIDS, TB and malaria, non-government organisations and of course the private sector doing some fantastic work. So for example, from midnight to 1am this morning I was part of a, a phone hookup saying in the context of the outbreak of Ebola in West Africa, what about malaria? Because the vast majority of those countries, many have got high rates of malaria. Most of the fevers will be related to far more from malaria than Ebola at the moment. But what if no one's actually prepared to see a patient? What if no one wants to do a needle stick a prick to look at a blood slot? So do you need a public health strategy that says every fever should first be treated as a patient with malaria and then do the next sort of thing? And how do you work with the agencies? The countries are obviously National Area Control Programs, UNICEF, everyone else. What do we as a partnership recommend what should you do if you're the Minister for Health or the Malaria Control in Guinea, Sierra Leone, one of those countries? The risk would be that in addition to the deaths from malaria, 
you get deaths from other causes. What, are, what happens if there's an outbreak of meningococcal meningitis? And they have epidemic meningococcal disease in those areas. But people say, oh, well, we're too worried about Ebola. These are huge public health in, uh, issues, and that's when the partnership can try. Its usual role is about harvesting money, getting coordination, getting normative roles of groups like WHO. So in summary today, um, I think there have been fantastic progress in malaria, and so others have said, let's try to eliminate malaria. There's been inadequate funding, a fraction of what we need. The sums are not huge that are actually required. There's a risk of resurgence if we drop the ball now. We've got the problem of resistance to antimalarial drugs of the parasite and insecticide resistance in mosquitoes. We need to build the human capacity to deal with this and particularly the communities involved and in the post-2015 agenda, I would argue that malaria must reign, remain up there in order that we don't lose the gains of the last uh, two decades. Thank you very much for your attention.